Wonderful. Um, your emphasis on stories connects nicely with our next, next speaker as well. Um, Spring Creek Project has long revered the profound power of stories to shape our world. If we can't first envision a future in which all living beings can thrive, and if we can't tell that narrative, then how can we help bring that future into being? Our next speaker, Angus McGuire, also believes deeply in stories. He is the communications manager at the Center for Story-Based Strategy. The organization offers training and strategic support to social justice organizations and alliances to change the story on the issues that matter most. A parent, designer, organizer, facilitator, and communication strategist, Angus uses story-based strategy for everything from elder care and parenting to direct action planning. Angus was previously a communications organizer with Service Employees International Union. He spent the past 19 years creating visual communications with movements for collective liberation across the country. When he's not on the road with Center for Story-Based Strategy, you can find him at home with his family in Eugene, organizing to build power with homeless and precariously housed communities. Please give a warm welcome to Angus McGuire. So folks, I'm gonna apologize ahead of time. Um, I was very close to canceling today. I've been in bed for several days with cold. So among other things, I'm gonna be sniffling. And, oh, still can't see my pictures. Um, and I'm gonna be leaning more than I would like to on a script. So now there's a switch of some kind there. Between. Oh, is there a cursor up there? Oh, there we go. Thank you for that. Because that means I can, can I, woo. There it is. All right, folks, we'll get it figured out. Okay, uh, let me close this. All right, means it ends, the battle of the story for climate justice. Um, so, does that work? No. Oh, look at that. Okay, um, you heard a little bit about this already. Um, Center for Story-Based Strategy. Um, we're a movement building organization dedicated to harnessing uh, the power of narrative for social change. We offer social justice networks, alliances and organizations, the analysis, training, and strategic support to change the story on the issues that matter most. We are a queer women of color led organization, now 15 years old, and our work is in collaboration with dozens of frontline mostly black, indigenous, people of color-led organizations and communities around the country. That's all basically to say that this is not my TED talk. Uh, this is me sharing a bunch of what I think are pretty brilliant insights and tools co-created by a pretty amazing movement community. So uh, just real quick, show of hands, folks that have heard the term just transition. Yay. All right, great. So um, uh, this, is, uh, this is just by way of sort of uh, giving folks a context for the politics of the organization and myself. Um, just Transition started as this idea in the labor movement, which was basically we've got to figure out a way to organize workers that are in the energy industry and the fossil fuels industry and guarantee them through policy jobs in the, new, in the transition economy and a new energy economy. It's expanded into a bigger story, though. So our just transition stance says, after centuries of extracting natu natural labor and cultural resources, the profit-driven extractive economy is severely undermining the life support systems of the planet, right? Fossil fuels are not an infinite resource. So transition is inevitable, but justice in that process is not. Just transition is a framework for a fair and sustainable system shift from an old extractive economy to a new regenerative economy that is fair and just. And the basic tenets of that are, that uh, in uh, Just Transition, we all have meaningful work and the ability to take care of ourselves and our community, that we all have access to clean air, water, and a stable climate. Vibrant, resilient, and diverse cultures are self-determined, valued, and not commodified. And that deep democracy thrives, those most affected by decisions are making them. So that's where we're coming from. Uh, and so I'll just jump right into this thing that we call story-based strategy. Um, I might ask a couple of questions while I'm talking and folks should just feel free to yell it out. What do you see on the screen here? Awesome. What was that last one? Excellent. 
So it's a little dark. That's right. So if I move my cursor around, I can, I can point at the stars that are a little brighter here. So Big Dipper, Ursa Major, is uh, one of the right answers. Um, at Center for Story-Based Strategy, uh, we say that humans are the narrative animal. We connect the dots and create meaning out of what we see. Too often, progressives think that just because a story is factually true, that it will be meaningful to our audiences. But actually, just the opposite is the case. If a story is meaningful to people, they will believe that it is true. When we are trading in the realm of narrative, the currency is not truth, it is meaning. Now, truth matters, I'm not saying it doesn't, but it's not sufficient, not by a long shot. So in fact, we have to make our truth, the truth about injustice, racism, environmental destruction, meaningful to the people we are trying to reach. We know that the facts alone are not enough to transform understanding and reshape meaning in people's hearts and minds. Take something more. I'm gonna kind of go over just some basic core concepts for thinking about uh, narrative here. Um, in, addition, in addition to truth versus meaning, we talk a lot about narrative filters. So as humans, we see the world through different filters, lenses, if you will. Your meaning is different than mine because we're wearing different glasses. We've got different sets of experiences that inform our worldview. We see the world through the frames or the perspective of the narrative we already believe because it is meaningful to us. This visual metaphor is useful to remember just that we all wear different glasses and that those glasses are between us and the world. Another core concept for thinking about narrative and narrative strategy is framing. Folks are probably familiar with this. It's pretty uh, colloquial. Um, how you frame something affects how people see it. And the most basic way that we talk about framing is literally with a frame. One of the most powerful frames we have today, of course, is the edges of a screen, whether it's a television or a smartphone or a laptop. This here is a screenshot uh, from CNN coverage of the US invasion of Iraq in April 2003. Um, uh, sorry. This is coverage of the arrival of US troops in Baghdad Central Square in early April, and the infamous toppling of the Saddam statue. For those, those that were plugged in then, you'll remember we did not have smartphones, we did not have social media, really. Folks were sitting glued to their television sets when this was happening. So now, Many in this room uh, probably know the truth about this, but this is the story here that folks were seeing, right? A people's uprising against a brutal dictator and a heroic army supporting them to literally topple the dictator. But one of the most basic things about framing is what's inside and what's outside the frame. And this is the image that you weren't seeing on CNN, right? So this is from approximately the same moment in time. The statues in the process of being toppled the red square is approximately the frame that you saw before. This photo is taken by another journalist at the Palestine Hotel on the edge of the square. So you can see immediately that the story is not the story that we were being sold on CNN, right? In fact, we can see very, two very important things. It's not a giant crowd in a very populous city. We can also see that there's a ring of US tanks around the square, structuring and controlling who's there and who wants to be there. So the story's changed dramatically with a new frame, right? But framing isn't just um, sort of who's in and who's out. We also uh, can frame in pretty subtle ways. Um, this will be a little harder to read, so I'll read these out to you. Um, these are two images um, that reinforce how framing is powerful and can often be a matter of life and death. These are images of Hurricane Katrina survivors that circulated widely in the media uh, after the flooding of New Orleans. Both went out on different wire services within hours of each other on Tuesday, August 30th, 2005. On the left, the caption on the wire service reads, a young man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans. Oh. On the right, two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store after Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> so there's some obvious differences here, right? It's a great example of how racism operates in media coverage. And these two different frames are the same response of surviving. These are two different frames on the same response of surviving in the midst of adversity. And they have very significant and different consequences, right? They're saying you are finding stuff, then they're sending the National Guard to save you. They say that you're looting stuff, they're sending the National Guard to shoot you. So framing is a matter of life and death. And you know, just naming of things is another way that we frame, right? So folks are probably familiar with global warming versus climate change. This is a simple example. They expect there are opinions in the room about both of these other contenders for umbrella frames on the issue. 
Uh, I bring these up, though, just to highlight how naming works on framing and how our movements shift frames in response to changing conditions. So global warming is undeniably true, right? But truth versus meaning, climate change actually works a little better, at least in the sense that it takes into account folks' narrative glasses and understanding based on immediate experience and specific weather patterns and the place that they live on the globe. So um, it's the Center for Story-Based Strategy, so I have a little story for you. Um, and I'm just going to read it out. And if it helps you to picture things, you could close your eyes and listen. On the planet Earth in the 20th century, humankind came face to face with its impact on the Earth. Scientists developed an increasingly clear understanding that our industrial way of life was having cataclysmic impacts on the stability and sustainability of the planet's ecosystem. With human-caused temperatures rising, we saw we had the power to destroy the very systems upon which we sustain ourselves. Early understanding of this crisis was suppressed by the greedy fossil fuel industry, such that in the 21st century, time is running out. Even as millions make efforts to shift to sustainable lifestyles and practices, ascendant climate denialism threatens to turn back what little progress we've made. While cor corrupt and slow-moving bureaucrats and corporate CEOs dither, scientists have given us a new ultimatum. We have just 12 short years to avoid a tipping point, beyond which terrifying uncertainty lies. An apocalypse of our own making is coming if we don't rise to meet this challenge now. Does that work for folks? Just a little snapshot of a story. Does it resonate a little bit? Folks seen this image? Okay. So two boxes, equality and equity. We're going to get to that story. Um, uh, come back to that story that I just told you uh, repeatedly here in a little bit. So this image sort of describes this debate about what constitutes fairness, right? When my kids were young, I always said to them, much to their annoyance, fair is everyone getting what they need, not everyone getting the same thing, right? Equity versus equality. But this captures a debate about economics and fairness in the United States today, right? So this illustration gets at that idea, and it's useful as far as it goes. But at CSS, we like to push a psychic break moment. And so may, hopefully some of you are familiar with the three box. <laughs> yeah. So how does our understanding of the story change when we realize that the entire debate, the entire debate, this is the debate we're having about economics and fairness in the United States right now, is predicated on the existence of a fence. There's an assumption that is in both the progressive and the conservative versions of the story, right? As a sidebar. Um, uh, our organization has uh, a lot of free uh, stuff you can download from our website. And one of those things is a workshop guide uh, called The Fourth Box, which is actually a uh, participatory activity for folks to explore what comes in the fourth panel in this cartoon together. We're not going to get into that right now. But here's the point. The point is we have to get look good at looking for fences in our stories. The assumptions we share with the opposition or the status quo story that are limiting our conversation or limiting our ability to change the story. Maybe some folks are seeing where this is going. So um, I'm going to talk about dominant stories and control mythologies for a second. These are fences that are in both the opposition story right now and in this fable, the sort of uh, story time that I just gave you. Every social change effort is inherently a conflict between the status quo and change agents to control the framing of an issue. This contest is the battle of the story, the struggle to define meaning and thereby build power and momentum for change. The battle of the story is a narrative designed to connect with your audience's values, challenge underlying assumptions, and outcompete opposing narratives. So the story of Thanksgiving, whose story is it? It's the pilgrim story that is celebrated in the US, not the story of indigenous communities who suffered through colonialism and genocide, still do. Power shapes the point of view in the story. Another fence that too often exists in the, uh, the stories that we're trying to tell in the climate movement and exists in status quo stories, right? The story about our economy. The dominant economic origin story of this country is one of bootstrap industrialism, not the stolen labor and lives of 12 million enslaved people. <laughs> Remember the definition of mythology. It's a powerful story. Its power is not in its factual truth, but in its ability to offer meaning to people. Thus, both these origin myths are examples of how stories can normalize power and universalize a specific experience or perspective to the point of invisibilizing alternate or opposing perspectives. These are macro examples. 
that are part of the contested and conflicted origin stories of the US. We use them as examples because they are shared experience for many of us. However, this is the same dynamic that operates in a specific issue-based campaign, and these same basic questions we can ask as we begin a narrative power analysis of the issues that we confront. What are the existing stories operating for our audiences that filter out new messages? How has the story created a status quo that normalizes certain experiences or perspectives? How has power shaped the point of view in the story whose stories are being left out? So at CSS, we say, in order to achieve deep institutional change, we must shift meaning in the dominant culture. Culture, in turn, is made of stories. Stories are founded on assumptions. So intervention in stories can shift assumptions and contest dominant culture to help achieve fundamental change. Um, and so one of the tools that we use is this thing called elements of story. If you've got a literary background, you probably have seen or know of or think of other components to elements of a story. These are the ones that we've found useful in social change work. Um, so what's going to follow here is not going to be a step-by-step -step takedown of any particular narratives, either the opposition or mainstream uh, climate uh, narratives. And it's also not going to be some magic frames that you've never heard of before and are going to blow your mind and fix everything. Okay? <laughs> going to ask more questions than I'm going to answer. So when we talk about conflict, we, talk, we ask questions about how is the problem being framed? Who or what is the conflict between? Are there good guys and bad guys? In the conversation around climate right now, we've got kind of a conflict problem. There are a lot of narratives moving at once. There's never one narrative moving. This is an example of a narrative that moved in 1999 where 75,000 people took, the street, took to the streets of Seattle, Washington to protest, protest the World Trade Organization, right? right? This was in response, by the way, to a, global call from, to a call from the Global South to intervene in this organization. But we had a problem. And the problem was that nobody knew what the hell the WTO was. And so we had to make that conflict frame crystal clear. And we had to connect with a value that people already had, right? So we set it up democracy versus the WTO. And that was the reason that we were having that conversation in addition to a lot of people getting arrested and a lot of other stuff going on. We don't have a lot of conflict, a good conflict frames in the climate justice movement right now. Um, and in fact, one of the main conflict, um, shared conflict frames that we do have uh, is shared with the opposition, which is basically the argument about, is it happening, is it not? Is it happening, is it not? And that really doesn't get us anywhere, right? Another thing we do when we're looking at stories is uh, we start looking at the characters. So here's a sampling of characters we probably see um, when we're watching documentaries and news stories and thinking positively about work that's being done on, the clim on uh, climate justice right now. Um, politicians, some folks already mentioned uh, by folks that already spoke today. I'm pretty excited that Standing Rock is sort of at that level of the um, taking up space uh, in terms of characters in the story at the highest level narratives um, in the biggest parts of popular culture around climate. What, but what does it mean that indigenous peoples, the peoples of the global south, and the descendants of slaves in the US are all written out of so much of the story of climate resistance? And what does the story look like when those characters become part of our story? Another thing we ask folks to look at is imagery. These are the first four or five images that show up on Google when you search for climate change and you look at the images tab. So um, what's missing here? People. people, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to come back around to characters here, but you know, this, is, this is a problem. This isn't meeting folks um, where they're at, right, with their experiences and their values. Um, I'm going to, so uh, on another point on imagery, we, the thing that we say with uh, imagery quite often is this phrase, show, don't tell. If you've done any writing, or you've taken a writing class, you know it's this, this uh, edict from, uh, from the, the world of writing, right? Like, don't just kind of pedantically explain yourself when you're writing. Use, you know, colorful imagery and help people, show people what's happening. Don't just tell them what's happening, right? Um, this is an ex uh, so this is just a headline from a United Nations uh, website. Uh, it's an announcement from January 2015. The headline says, President Obama, climate change greatest threat to future generations. That's a tell. This, what we heard from at the beginning of this session with Jamie, that's a show, right? So something's changing. I wish I had a picture of you up here too, Jamie. Um, because uh, there's something powerful going on here, right? Characters are showing up in the imagery, and we're not just talking about future generations. We're talking about a generation acting for themselves and, and embodying and being part of the story. 
This is amazing and exciting. But the frame's still not big enough. So taking a step back, actually that show don't tell instruction is something that we really take to heart when we're talking to folks about narrative strategy. Um, so first a definition of strategy really quick. And I'm just gonna say this because it uh, feels like it's always useful. We are not the center for strategic storytelling. <laughs> we believe, we're the center for story-based strategy. So we believe that we can use story and understand story to, to structure the way that we act in the world to change the stories that we need to change. So when we talk about strategy, it's in our name. Uh, you can't say something strategic if you haven't considered the other alternatives, right? So for us, strategy is what you will not do in order to do the thing that you must do. And traditionally in strategic communications, that's my discipline, that's what I do with the organization mostly. The, the, the way the, the line works is saying the right thing to the right people at the right time. That's what PR folks say when they say strategic communications. We, we, we don't say it that way. We say doing the right thing with the right people at the right time. So coming back to characters and stories, Folks recognizing any of the faces here? So the woman on the lower left, her name, is, her name was uh, Berta Caceres. She was an environmental activist in Honduras. She was killed in 2016 by US trained special forces because of her successful leadership in uh, stopping a hydroelectric dam from displacing the communities, uh, the indigenous communities that she uh, uh, is a part of, was a part of. Uh, the young woman on the lower right could be our Greta, but she's not. Her name is also Berta. Um, I saw her speak at a conference in California a couple of weeks ago. So she's traveling the world and carrying on the legacy of her mother, the resistance. So this is, this is like the, f this is the front lines, right? When we talk about the front lines, this is, the, this is what happens when you really slow down the machine, right? So there's, there are clear questions going all the back, way back to some of those early slides uh, that are called here around um, racism and ethnocentrism and what stories we tell and, and who we're joining with um, to tell stories. This is a little dicey one. Show of hands, Anthropocene. Hey, okay. Show of hands, Capitalocene. Hey, okay. Okay, I'm not an expert on either of these things. Um, so I'm going to do a very cursory definition for folks that don't know. Anthropocene is the idea that humanity's impact is so broad, vast, specific, and um, permanent on the Earth's geological record that we actually need to add a new epoch to the stack in the diagram on the right. We're no longer in the Holocene. The argument goes we're in the Anthropocene because you can in millions of years from now, we will be able to um, look back and see when this period started, right? And there's different ways that folks talk about doing that in the carbon record, uh, uh, radiation from nuclear testing, um, actual uh, plastic sediment. There's all sorts of ways that that might happen. This is an argument in the sciences. There is not officially an agreed upon thing called the Anthropocene. But this is a story. And there are folks that are arguing that we should be talking about a different epoch that has started. But actually, we need to be a little bit more specific. And that it's not really fair to say that humanity created this new epoch. Because it was actually a relatively small number of people in relatively specific places at very specific points in history who had the power to create the systems that make it possible to measure this new era on the Earth. So, I was laying in bed for the last five or six days, actually. <coughs> and I was watching a lot of climate documentaries. I thought, what better way to be thinking about this? And I don't really have anything else to do. And I watched, uh, rewatched um, uh, an inconvenient sequel, the second film that Al Gore made. Have folks seen that? Yeah. I'm so curious. OK. So um, there is this moment uh, about an hour into the film that, uh, that grabbed me quite powerfully. This is another uh, of these elements of the story. Underlying assumptions. The question we ask is, what does one have to believe to accept the story as true? She says on camera here at Paris, uh, the 2015 Paris Climate Talks, never before has a responsibility so great been in the hands of so few. So that's not true. 
Um, actually, the responsibility, or at least the power, has been in the hands of so few for quite a very long time. And this is somebody who is dedicating her life and work to doing something about the climate crisis, right? So to me, immediately, I see offense. I see an assumption that's shared by too many of our stories and uh, the stories that, um, that are told by the powers that be right now. Um, I'm totally going to get lost in my own notes now. Um, so, oh yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so the question then becomes, what would our world look like if all the millions of people in Africa and the Americas in the dawn of capitalism had had a voice in how humanity systems would develop? Would we be where we are now? And the attendant question is, what if those whose backs upon which this deadly system was built were seen as the leaders in the democratic movement to change humanity's story now? Um, this is uh, one more bit um, uh, that I feel like I need to touch on before I sort of uh, land. And I don't think I've gotten a, oh, I've got five minutes. All right, okay. Um, so foreshadowing is this other piece of thinking about uh, narrative strategy. And uh, this is just really important to me. Um, uh, and it's been brought up already by the first two speakers. Um, foreshadowing is how, how does each story sort of show us the future, right? What's the vision that the story offers um, in talking about the future? And we get a positive and negative foreshadowing. And this is something that we see a lot, climate change, urgent ad action needed to avert a crisis for children. So this is a, this is a we, this is a, a description of the world, right, that erases all of the children in the world who are already on the front lines. It erases the children being separated at the southern border because they and their families have migrated north because of climate change in their home, in their home places in Central America, right? So we have to start thinking about how we're doing foreshadowing because the urge to sort of get urgency and get people to see this like danger that's coming bleeds into an urge, uh, leads into a tendency to erase real stories that we need to bring up right now in the movement. And we use this image when we're talking about all sorts of different is issues and, and foreshadowing. And I'll just, I'll, I'll just say this. We remember this speech and it definitely has something to do with the fact that it was I have a dream and not I have a nightmare. <laughs> so, um, I'm actually going to land back, maybe surprisingly, on this slide uh, to finish up here. So I imagine that many of you have dreams of a positive future, some kind of ecotopia. What might be possible if our leaders were sensible, if we had science-based policy? But I, I hope that some of what I and the first two speakers uh, have talked about here today shakes those dreams up a little bit, because if if those dreams and that imagination don't include the global south, if they don't include our indigenous communities, if they don't include the deepest, most transformative change in relationships in our movements, who we're working with, who our leaders are, and in our daily lives, then we aren't dreaming big enough. If we fail to widen the frame to include, to include those who were excluded from the decision making from the very beginning of the capitalist project, then we won't fundamentally change the story enough. So we use this slide um, in lots of basic trainings um, in much the way that I did to start here. We typically use it um, the way I did to, to explain uh, the power of framing and the power of a single word choice uh, and uh, in the example of racism and bias in the media. But right here in this slide is the question we face in the terms of means and ends in the title of this talk. So this is survival. These are resilient responses to a climate crisis. It's not in the future, it's right here in this country. <laughs> and in this moment, the most basic rule of our society is being broken. Who owns? What can you own? How much can you own? We can see in this terrible moment the choice we're already faced with. Are we going to let our imaginations be constrained by the rules of the system that is killing us? some of us slowly and some of us more quickly? Or are we going to expand our imaginations, the stories we tell, the stories we live, to widen the frame and win the battle of the story for climate justice? Thanks, folks. Mm -hmm.